So in this video, we're going to be talking about writing an interpretive paper. This is information that you're going to need for any of the papers that you write for this course. So uh, this pertains, in other words, to, the, uh, to any of the written assignments that you're doing for this course, uh, and theoretically for any other history paper, because ultimately what you're doing when you're writing a history paper is expressing an opinion. And this is the vital thing that is extremely important, is that you need to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is that you're writing, it is expressing an opinion, it is making an argument. And you need to do this by stating clearly what it is that you want to convince the reader of, um, a, an explicit statement of, of opinion, known as the thesis statement, uh, and then to convince your reader of that opinion uh, through the use of, of evidence and the interpretation of that evidence. Uh, uh, and this is the thing. This is the this is the meat and potatoes of history. This is how uh, historians work. This is how um, uh, the past is understood. Because, uh, as uh, I've already uh, outlined, there are no facts in history. All of our evidence is flawed. All of our evidence is um, is partial, selected, damaged, uh, subject to bias, subject to point of view, um, and as a result. Uh, our understanding of history has to come from historians making an argument, uh, interpreting the, the flawed and damaged evidence that we have. And uh, in no case is this more true than in ancient history, where the evidence is, um, uh, is, the, is, the, is the most uh, um, uh, randomly, uh, uh, randomly present, randomly missing, uh, uh, selected, damaged, um, subjected to uh, every different kind of the problems of, of the evidence that we've described. And so what we need to do is to, um, is to, uh, uh, is to have a strategy for interpreting history. And this is what we, uh, this is what we talk about in this video. Uh, this is discussed in, in even greater detail in the pamphlet writing a position paper, which is uh, handed out in class and also available on the website in PDF form. So the basic idea here is that what you're doing is interpretation. The, the action that you are undertaking is interpreting uh, history, making an argument. And so uh, this consists of, of three components. First of all, what is the, the problem? Uh, you're starting with a question. Uh, uh, the, this, is a, this is something that historians might argue about. Uh, you know, why did such and such a thing happen? Or, you know, did such and such a thing uh, uh, constitute a great idea or a bad idea on the part of, a, of an historical individual? Uh, or what were the effects of such and so? Uh, so it could be something that historians argue about, or it could be something that people of the time might have argued about. Uh, you know, for you know, for the Romans, for example, the Romans might have argued, uh, you know, amongst themselves over whether to pursue uh, aggressive imperial expansion in the East once their nemesis Carthage had been uh, eliminated as a threat. So you have to start with a question, a specific question, and you need to uh, it need to be clear on what that question is. It needs to be part of what you're addressing. It needs to be, uh, um, it, you know, it, it needs to be expressed before you can go any further in the paper. The second thing is, what are the possible answers? It needs to have, um, you know, different uh, possible. Uh, resolutions, uh, your your problem. Uh, if there is only one possible answer, then there's no point in writing the paper. Um, there is there is nothing being accomplished. No interpretation is taking place. Uh, if no one could rationally disagree with the the point that you're trying to make, you know, uh, it, you know something straightforward like, um, you know, uh, you know if you're if you're trying to argue that. Um, you know, the clouds is a play that was performed in in Athens. Uh, nobody is going to disagree with that. If you're going to prefer, pr you know, project something, uh, try to argue something radical, uh, like uh, you know, like uh, Julius Caesar was actually a space alien, uh, then you're you know, then you're in 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 a, a real position to make a paper that will that will make a tremendous amount of waves. The more provocative, the more outlandish your position 
audiences. The more attention it's going to get, um, the more impact it's going to have on its reader, uh, the more it's going to change our understanding of history if, of course, you have the evidence to back up your assertions. But you start with your argument uh, um, and then ensure that uh, what it is that you are trying to argue, your answer to the question, is then something that you convince your reader of through the use of, of through the presentation of evidence and your interpretation of that evidence. So, for example, this is the example that I use in the pamphlet, uh, uh, did Hannibal make a mistake in using elephants as a part of his, uh, his uh, attempted conquest of the Romans in, in the Second Punic War in one of the most climactic episodes of Roman history. And, uh, you know, elephants, war elephants, had been used uh, extensively in the past. Uh, the question is, did it make sense for Hannibal to use elephants uh, as a part of his, uh, his uh, invasion of Italy? So, this is our problem. This is our question. Did Hannibal's elephants make a difference? Was it something that... Um, uh, that uh, you know was a was a rewarded for the effort that was put into the the monumental task of bringing thirty self thirty seven elephants uh, across the Alps into into Italy. Uh, then you you know then you have possible rational uh, answers to your to your problem um, that they you know that it was important to the. Uh, to the invading army, um, that uh, it was uh, useful in intimidating the, the Romans, um, uh, or conversely, that, um, that they did more harm than good. And then you present your own thesis, you present your own argument, what it is that you are going to prove in this paper. And this is by far the most vital part of whatever it is that you write, whether it's a short essay or a term paper. Um, the, the absolute crux of what it is that you're doing is this statement. And it needs to be a firm statement of opinion that someone could disagree with. And it needs to be specific and grounded in the reasons why um, you, uh, you are making the statement. You don't need to go into detail, but uh, um, uh, being able to say, you know, I believe that Hannibal's use of elephants is a mistake is a start on a thesis statement, but it's relatively weak because um, what you're doing is trying to, to grab the reader and say, um, this is something that it is, uh, that it is reasonable to believe. This is something that um, is, is, a, a, is a, a rational interpretation of history. And so uh, you give a a brief summary of the reasons why that this is going to be true, and then you're going to present those reasons in further detail in the rest of the paper. So uh, uh, you need to have a, a, a thesis statement that is a, a statement of opinion that someone could disagree with, and then part of that is, is giving a taste of why it is that your thesis statement um, is, is going to be shown to be uh, valid to the reader. Um, then, once you have that, that provides your structure for the paper. That provides the, the rest of, of what you're going to be uh, the, what you're going to be doing. So the body of your paper is showing why uh, your thesis statement is is valid. And and generally speaking, uh, historians love the rule of three: three reasons why it, it feels convincing. Three reasons why shows the reader. Um, that uh, that this is viable. Uh, this is uh, sometimes referred to as the three pillars, um, and so it can be three different kinds of things. It, it depending on what it is that you're arguing, uh, three different aspects of your problem, three different reasons why the th the the thesis is true, or three different steps in showing that it's true, uh, or it can be three different uh, examples of what it is that you're trying to say. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, your, the structure in, in this example, uh, Hannibal made a mistake, is my thesis. And then um, the, the body of the paper is going to be determined by the three assertions that support that. Uh, that in general, element, uh, elephants were not a, a bad idea, that they had been used successfully in the past. Um, B, that, uh, that uh, adaptability was a key trait of the Romans. And... Uh, and see that it was Roman adaptability, the fact that they adapted to the use of elements, 
elephants that ultimately made them uh, um, ineffective in Hannibal's uh, uh, conquest of, of Italy. So your structure of the paper is laid out, uh, the three pillars, the three assertions, uh, and then uh, at the end of the paper, uh, you, there, there are two things that, that tie it up. Uh, the first is to, to deal with whatever it is that a reader might be thinking of that, uh, that would be um, a counter-argument, that would be something that someone would say to disagree with you. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, for example, if you were trying to argue that, uh, you know, the, the Romans were fundamentally a peaceful people and, uh, uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that they are, you know, that their efforts to create an empire, uh, you know, was uh, nothing but beneficial to the peoples that they ruled over and so forth, the reader is going to be thinking, well, but hey, what about all those people that the Roman legions killed? Or say that... Um, you know, you're talking about um, the the Greeks never created a, a, an empire. That uh, that the the Greek city state always remained um, independent and autonomous. The reader is going to be thinking. The reader who has studied Greek history is going to be thinking. Well, hey, what about the Athenian Empire? Why why was that not really an empire? Uh, and so the point is, your the strongest paper is going to be one that. That not one that ignores that counter argument, but one that grips it firmly and shows why um, it doesn't pertain. Um, that uh, destroys the counter argument as well as making positive arguments in defense of the thesis. If you destroy your enemy's position as well, uh, think of this as uh, as you know you're holding a debate with some other person on a stage. You can think of it as war and and uh, and do it in a Sun Tzu kind of way, or well, you know however you want to think about it. But uh, it's it's not enough to make positive arguments in support of your thesis. You also need to destroy um, the the arguments that someone would be using because otherwise, if a reader is thinking of that argument. He's just going to read through the whole paper and, and thinking the whole time. But what about X? But what about X? He's going to get to the end of your paper. You've made your argument, and he's still thinking. But what about X? You've completely failed. Um, and then uh, your conclusion ties together all of this. It ties to, it shows it goes through each of your assertions, your your three assertions, and your counter argument, whatever that may be, uh, and shows how each of these things. Uh, supports your overall thesis and shows that your thesis is a, is, a, is a valid argument. And so your structure overall of your interpretive paper looks something like this. You have an introduction that, uh, that states the problem, gives the possible answers, and then explicitly states your thesis of what it is that you're going to be arguing and the hints of why it's true. Uh, and then you show uh, in each section, you show you describe your evidence and then discuss it. And then you describe your evidence for your second assertion and discuss it. And then you make your third assertion, describe the evidence, and, uh, uh, and discuss how, it sh how, it, uh, how the evidence supports your assertion. Uh, and then at the end of the paper, you, you, you link them all together and demonstrate that uh, you've shown that your thesis statement is, is effective. Um, in, in making your argument, uh, uh, your uh, assertions need to be supported by evidence. This evidence needs to come from primary sources or secondary sources or both. Uh, tertiary sources are not allowed uh, in any history paper, certainly in any history paper for me. Uh, and this means that uh, you are not allowed to use uh, textbooks, encyclopedias, uh, almost everything on the internet is a tertiary source, with the exception of a online scholarly journals and b uh, transcriptions of, of primary sources. But everything else, any other web page that you're going to be looking at, um, whatever it talks about, uh, whatever it says about it, you know, however you know detailed it looks, uh, it's probably a tertiary source. If you have a question about it, you can ask me. But ultimately, this means that almost everything on the internet you cannot use. You need to use primary sources or secondary sources because tertiary sources are, are you know, gobble, garbled uh, compromises. Um, they eliminate uh, uh, they, all, of the, um, all of the arguments, positions. They're the, the most distorted 
uh, furthest from the events and the evidence that we have. And then um, you need to show all of your evidence. You need to show where it comes from. Uh, and so this means that so all of your evidence needs to be properly cited using footnotes and bibliography. Um, the reason for this is, A, uh, that your reader needs to be able to track down you, you know, the evidence that you provided in order to, um, in order to read further, in order to, uh, you know, to find out more about what it is that you're talking about, uh, you know, for his or her own reasons. Uh, and B, you need to demonstrate a, 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 a distinct uh, difference between what is your thinking and what is someone else's thinking. So if you have information, you know, if you're reading a book by Professor Jones, Professor Jones says, you know, hey, uh, uh, you know, the, the Athenian Empire wasn't really an empire for this, that, and the other reason. And, you know, you write in your paper, hey, the Athenian Empire is not an empire for this, that, and the other reason. If you don't cite Professor Jones's book, which is where you got it from, that's fraud. That's intellectual dishonesty. That's plagiarism. Um, and not only will that have academic consequences for this paper and this course, but it's fundamentally uh, uh, dishonest. Um, and so the, the profession of history has a rigorous process of ensuring that everything that's not your own opinion, your interpretation, has to be explicitly cited, has to be linked back to where it comes from. Um, and so, you know, each uh, section under each assertion involves uh, making an assertion, describing the evidence, uh, giving any uh, secondary material that uh, is in support of this, um, and then discussing it, showing how your evidence from the primary source to the secondary source, or both, uh, is, is showing the value of your assertion. So the best way to do this is to make your assertion first. Um, at the beginning of, of each you know, section of the body of your paper. Just make your assertion and then describe your evidence and then show how that evidence, just make a discussion of how that uh, uh, evidence is, is, supports your thesis. And this also has a, has a way, of, uh, as the useful side effect of, of making a nice distinction uh, between you know, your evidence uh, that uh, it has your citations and so forth, and then you go on to your discussion of it um, which is clearly in your voice and clearly your interpretation. Um, so if you're doing something that requires research, you know, some papers uh, do not require, you know, additional research. If you're, you know, writing about the clouds or, or something like this uh, and, and, you know, your, your question is limited to something that's happening within the clouds or something like that, um, then there's less to worry about. But uh, if you're doing a, a broader paper that uh, requires finding more sources and so forth, uh, then there are different ways to find what it is that you need. And so uh, your, your text will often have uh, suggested readings that, uh, that name specific sources that are important in a particular topic. Um, you can look up uh, relevant primary sources that have come up in class, either in a text or whatever, uh, and uh, links to uh, classical sources, ancient sources, and translation are available on my website. Um, and then you start to look for uh, uh, books that might be relevant. Uh, these include um, books that are available uh, directly through the Lehman Library. Uh, you can uh, access, you can it, within the CUNY system, you can have a book that exists at, uh, you know, that uh, the uh, Brooklyn College or John Jay or whatever, you can have it sent to you here and you can pick it up in Leaf Library. Uh, you can get a book um, that you need that isn't available in the CUNY system. You can get it through interlibrary loan. Um, it might be worthwhile to make a trip to the public library, uh, the uh, the main research library at, uh, um, at 42nd and 5th. Um, has a lot of books that simply aren't available uh, elsewhere. Uh, WorldCat is a website that can tell you um, you know, a, a, not only the details of a particular book and the citation information, but also um, where, in what libraries it can be found. And um, the, the, the books that you already have, 
will often have footnotes that will point you to important works within a particular field. So if you're reading a book and uh, you know the, the the book is constantly saying, you know, hey, you know, the 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 authority on the subject is Professor Jones, Professor Jones says, and the footnote says, you know, here's Professor Jones's book and this is written, cited on this particular page, maybe it's worthwhile going and tracking down Professor Jones's book at see if, because that's the authority on this particular topic. Um, what I found in library research is that uh, uh, is that the most effective thing to do is you know your your card catalog search in the um, you know your topic search on the website um, and uh, you know will will point you toward a uh, you know a cluster or two of call numbers and then it's uh, what's what's actually most effective is to go and browse that shelf because usually. I found that the book that I actually need when I'm doing research is on the shelf, you know, next to the one that came up in the card catalog search. Um, and so you find the clusters of call numbers that uh, represent a particular topic, you know, and in the case of the example that we're using here, uh, you, you might find a cluster around Roman history, a cluster around um, the history of the, the Punic War, uh, a cluster around uh, the use of elephants in war. Um, and so you go and look at the at the shelf uh, where those call numbers are clustering, and you pull down the books that are there. You look at the table of contents. You look at the index. If the table of contents and the index don't refer to anything that looks like it'll be useful, you put it back on the shelf. But uh, uh, if the uh, if the table of contents and index look like it might be promising, like like it might uh, be of use to you, then you found an additional source. In addition to books, uh, um, uh, scholarly journal articles uh, can also be very useful to you. Uh, journal articles are often on a very specific question. So you might have a book that's on war elephants, or you might have a book that's on, you know, Hannibal or Hannibal's invasion of Italy. Uh, and then journal articles are going to be on a specific question like, you know, was Hannibal left-handed? Or something like close to what you're writing about, like, did Hannibal make a mistake in using elephants against the Romans? And you might find, you know, maybe two or three articles that argue different sides of this question. And so one of the main resources for this is, uh, is JSTOR, uh, which is a database of uh, journal articles available through the Leaf Library website. And this gives you, um, uh, this allows you to download PDFs of, of the entire journal article, uh, which you can then, uh, you know, use within your, as part of your research. And, you know, finally, uh, it doesn't hurt to ask me. Uh, if you're if you're stumped, if you're wondering whether something might be useful or not, if you're wondering whether something is a is a is a source that is allowed or not, uh, just come and talk to me. And so the way citations work, um, the uh, uh, um, the citations consist of two components. One is the footnote, uh, and the other is the bibliography. So the bibliography lists all of the sources that you have used, your books and your journal articles. Um, it lists them all together in alphabetic order. And then within the body of your work, uh, everything, every time that you need to, to cite something where, you, where you've presented evidence from your source, um, you're pointing to one of the items in your bibliography. And all that you really need to do is, is, is have a unique identifier. Um, usually it's just the author name or you can use author name plus, uh, plus year. Uh, and then on top of that, what page within that book or article this piece of evidence can be found. So your footnote is, is pointing to an item in your bibliography plus a page number. And so uh, here are some examples of, of how things are uh, cited in your bibliography. The main thing is that uh, you know, your reader needs to be able to find them. And so you provide who the author is, um, the, uh, the year, the title, uh, and the publication information. For a book, like uh, you know, the third item on this list, uh, it's, uh, it, you know, it's author, year, title, and then uh, the information about the publisher, the city in which it's published, and the name of the publisher. For a journal article, you provide the uh, the title of the article, and then the name of the journal, um, the volume number, and uh, the page range 
um, that uh, this article covers. And all of that information is going to be um, on, the, on the cover page of the article as you download it. Um, the the year part of this is is important also to uh, give an indication of of how fresh your sources are. Uh, uh, history is is constantly undergoing uh, changes uh, uh, in in uh, in consensus. Uh, uh, old uh, opinions are are overturned by new generations of historians. New interpretations come along that uh, that cast the periods and, and individuals in a new light. And so as a result, uh, something that um, you know, a book that was written about, uh, you know, war elephants or whatever in uh, 1944, for example, might be considerably outdated. And um, uh, if, you, if you have, um, you know, uh, stale sources like this, uh, that might call into question the, the, the evidence that you provided. Um, you should be trying to find uh, the most up-to-date information that you can. And so uh, here's an example of uh, footnotes um, uh, functioning as, uh, as a reference to an item in a bibliography uh, plus, the, uh, plus the page number. And uh, here's an important thing. You notice that this footnote does not refer to a quote. One of the biggest misapprehensions in terms of citations, uh, so many students uh, fall into this trap. They think that you only have to provide a footnote if you're directly quoting the source material. This is not the case. You have to provide a citation um, of any information that comes from your source, whether you're quoting it, paraphrasing it, referring to an idea, anything that comes from your source has to be footnoted, whether it's in quotes or not. This is extremely important, and, and uh, uh, so many people mess this up and get points taken off for citations um, because they did not provide the necessary citations. Um, another thing that uh, is, uh, uh, is a little bit different for ancient history, uh, ancient sources, so you know things like the clouds, things like uh, Gilgamesh, things like you know Homer's Iliad, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, ancient sources are um, there are so many different versions and editions and translations of it that there is a common reference system for uh, for ancient sources for classical sources, uh, and so um, ancient this this way, uh, if you refer to um, uh, here, for example, Homer's Iliad, Book 16, uh, um, and uh, and you go to uh, Section 431. Um, this will this is something that everybody can find in their edition, no matter how different it is from everyone else. It isn't dependent on a page number in a particular version. Um, you know, out of all the thousands of different versions of the of the Iliad that are out there. And so the, this is why this is customary. Um, there are a number of standardized abbreviations for all of these works, uh, and uh, you can find those on my website on the Ancient Texts page, um, or you know you can check with me if you're uh, if there's something that you want to you know uh, if you want to ask about. But the point is that uh, you know you you make this standardized reference um, to a, the the ancient author the work. And you know, usually it's in books uh, uh, and sections uh, for something like the clouds that isn't even divided up into acts. Then you can just point to a particular line number, and then in your bibliography, you need to show which version, uh, which translation is the one that you used in in your discussion. And again, this is regardless, as you see the example here. This is regardless of whether you do a direct quote or paraphrase, or you're just referring to something that happens at a particular moment uh, in the source material. So, uh, points to remember. Um, everything that, uh, that is not your interpretation has to be cited. Direct quotes, paraphrases, information, ideas, anything that comes from outside of your head has to be cited, has to have a footnote and um, uh, be listed in your bibliography. Uh, everything in your paper should support your thesis argument. You don't. Uh, what the point of this paper? This paper exists uh, as a support system for your thesis statement. You don't need to provide a huge amount of background. If you're writing a paper about the clouds, you don't need to tell me the plot of the clouds. I know the plot of the clouds. Um, what you need to do is to describe the particular moments in the clouds that support the arguments and assertions that you're making. 
Uh, likewise, if you're if you are you know if you're writing a paper, say for example, to use the example here uh, about uh, you know Hannibal's war elephants, you don't need to to um, give a a narrative of Hannibal's invasions and the movements of the elephants. Um, that's not in support of your thesis. That's not making any argument. That's just wasting paper. Um, describing things. Your paper exists in order to make an argument. Uh, and so everything that um, is extraneous to that, anything that's background to that, that is not necessary to make an argument, that isn't evidence in support of your thesis, throw it out. Uh, it doesn't need to be there. Make sure that your paper uh, does what uh, was asked of you, um, that it meets the requirements of the paper. Um, and most of all, when you get to the end of it, um, go back and read through it and, and uh, ask yourself, is this paper making an argument? Is it, is it doing something to convince the reader of an opinion about history? Uh, and if you've done that, uh, then you have a solid paper and you're good, in good shape. And that's that.